So despite all of the aforementioned research, many Parkinson disease cases still arise completely spontaneously. They have, you know, none of the obvious genetic loci that, that we typically follow. Um, knowledge is power. But please keep in mind, just because some associations have been identified, correlation does not imply causation. So some studies have shown that taking statin medications, ibuprofen, caffeine, even smoking, I'm actually amazed at all of the studies that, that they've done with smoking and Parkinson, but they show that statin, ibuprofen, caffeine, and smoking are actually protective against not developing Parkinson. That does not mean go out and start taking all of these things and, and start smoking. Um, but you know, that being said, what we're hypothesizing, perhaps people who will eventually develop Parkinson's disease are naturally or genetically less likely to begin smoking or more likely to quit. Some theorists say that nicotine is protective. It's a good thought. Uh, while others hypothesize that those who eventually develop Parkinson's disease are just less likely to participate in high-risk behaviors. So there, there's a lot of things that still need to be teased out. And again, knowledge is power. That's why it's so important to be aware and update your physician and, and get tested. Uh, let's see. So uh, we talked a little bit about kind of the hallmark signs with resting and, and intention tremors. So with Parkinson disease, the resting tremor tends to be worse. Um, and then ultimately the, the patient will shake so severely that they can't perform uh, activities of daily living. And then that eventually requires around the clock help. Um, walking eventually becomes extremely difficult. Um, so it's, it's frequently called pill rolling or cogwheel rigidity in the medical community. And to kind of break this down for the patient, we have a lot of just medical terms that we use. Um, cogwheel rigidity is like if you're, for, well, it's hard. I don't know if I want to demonstrate here on the computer, but um, it's where you'll kind of initiate a movement and, and you're like kind of, it's like this stop and go sort of movement instead of like a very fluid, continuous movement. And uh, currently my brain sends signals down to the muscles in my arm that tell one muscle to move, for an example. But when I want to stop the movement, there's neurons in my head that communicate to the muscles that, you know, to say, okay, stop this movement, and they're called inhibitory. So it's a balance of excitatory and inhibitory neurons. And in Parkinson disease, that the ability of the brain to do any of that kind of deteriorates. And so that's why you get the, the pill rolling or cogwheel rigidity that we use in the medical community. Um, and then also patients will develop non-motor symptoms, such as, you know, mental things, for sure that they'll get depressed, they'll have sleep disturbances, sensory deficits, and other issues with the autonomic nervous system that significantly impair their, their quality of life. Um, so there are three clinical subtypes of Parkinson's disease. And again, we're still trying to figure out with these subtypes, okay, are they associated with specific genes? We're, we're just not there yet. Uh, we, but we will. I'm really confident in the next couple of years. So three subtypes. There's the tremor dominant. There's the akinetic rigid subtype. And then there's the postural instability or gait difficulty subtype. So just to review, there's one type where you just shake uncontrollably. Uh, the second type is where you tend to be more rigid. And then the third is where it's really, it's a bigger issue with your gait and, and walking. Um, studies show that the tremor dominant subtypes tend to have a slower progression and less neurological impairment than the others, but there's still been so many cases of patients that will start out, you know, the first year or so within one subtype and then they just completely, you know, they just switch over to another. So there's a lot of crossover. This is kind of a rough draft way for, for clinicians to try to characterize disease types and symptoms and severities so that as we're doing more genetic research, we can kind of tease out, okay, these specific subtypes and symptoms are associated with this particular gene. Um, to date, currently, clinicians truly, we just have no clear way of predicting how rapidly or severely a patient will decline based on their monogenetic variations. Hopefully we'll, we'll have more research on this soon. Um, most patients develop symptoms after the age of 60. 
but we talked about how there are a lot of documented cases where they develop symptoms sooner. Um, those that develop Parkinson's disease, though, before the age of 50 are thought to have a, a pretty solid genetic root cause, and, and that's where we're still doing the genetic analysis. Uh, data is limited, but there was a study recently published from the UK that showed that in a population sample of about 2,000 patients with Parkinson, only 1.4% were actually due to motogenetic mutations, with 3% of those cases being early onset, so again, less than 50 years old. Um, this is great. We need more studies like this, but this study was only able to be done because 2,000 people got genetically tested. So again, knowledge is power. Let's get people genetically tested. Um, while scientists have identified these monogenetic beginnings, we still do not understand the exact molecular mechanisms that actually cause neuronal death in the substantia nigra, and then eventually, you know, you, you don't make any dopamine. We're still trying to figure out at the molecular level what is going on. Um, aging, inflammation, protein aggregation, mitochondrial dysfunction, oxidative stress, neurotoxins, you know, all these big medical words. We found that those things do contribute to uh, neuronal death and, and symptom severity, but we still really need to figure out the, the deeper molecular pathways. Uh, and, and this is a mystery that, that remains to be solved. But as a patient, what you can do to help us is if you start developing any kind of dementia symptoms or if you have people in your family with known Parkinson, get tested. Um, I'll touch on this briefly at the end of this video, uh, that there is the psychological kind of opportunity cost for knowing, though, if you have a gene. Think really long and hard about that. If you, for example, if your dad has Parkinson and you get tested and you carry the autosomal recessive or autosomal dominant gene, um, do you really want to spend the next 20, 30 years kind of knowing, okay, this is my future. I will end up this way. Some people find that is empowering. They think, okay, I can plan for it. Uh, others, it, it may cause a lot of undesired depression and anxiety, knowing, oh, wow, I do have these genes and, and this is my, my future. So think on it. Um, what, uh, what you can do with a lot of your physicians, too, is if you want to help the medical community and genetic research is get tested. But often I would have patients ask me or tell me, I don't want to know. So take this information, you know, and, and this goes out to like all genetic things, whether it's cancer or lipid disorders. So you can ask your provider to test you, help the community and research, but you don't necessarily have to know. And I, I think for a lot of patients, that's that's a that's the better way to go.